this is the plane that I flew in Korea, the type of airplane that I flew there. Uh, it's the P-51D. Uh, great airplane. This is the North American F-86. One of the nicest, sweetest airplanes that ever, ever flew. Very responsive, very agile, quite comfortable to fly. Not quite a Mach 1 airplane, but boy was it a joy in the air. I was raised in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, New York, which is right next to Coney Island, between Coney Island and below Flatbush. Just about lived in the flight path of Floyd Bennett Field, which was uh, just down the road from us. And we used to hear all the airplanes flying in and out of there all the time. My brothers and I, we, the rock boys, those rock boys as we were called, because if anybody uh, heard us, you know, clink, bang, scrape, roar, whatever, we were always making some sort of a mechanical noise. My brothers uh, were Preston, the older, oldest one, Gardner, the middle one, and me, Curtis, the baby. Floyd Bennett Field was like Mecca to us. We would rather go there than go watch a football game or a baseball game or anything, just to go over and see those airplanes and, and even now and then meet one of those pilots, those pioneer pilots. We were just fascinated by Floyd Bennett Field. There was Roscoe Turner, of course, the guy who walked around in a military uniform and carried a lion cub with him all the time. He was a transcontinental speed racing pilot. He had the record several times between Los Angeles and New York. And then there was Andy Stinnis. Andy Stinnis could write in the sky. He did that. That was his, just beautiful. Make these advertisements for Pepsi-Cola or whomever with his airplane in the sky. I loved it. And then there was Howard Hughes, came by every now and then. And then there was Wiley Post, who uh, was a international speed pilot who ended up uh, dying uh, in Alaska with movie star, Will Rogers. We, we, all three of us, used to fly the Dagon slush pump in the bathroom. The little, the toilet uh, cleaner with stick. And we would fly all over the world. We would fly the Himalaya Mountains. We would fly over Africa, the North Pole, anywhere on the planet. One of us, because that was all we could do with, sit in the pilot seat, which of course was uh, the main seat in the little toilet room. The guys would bang on the door and say, I'll kill you, I've got to go and get out of there. I don't let me in. And we were going, didn't hear anything from them. It was always just flying anywhere, all, all over this beautiful planet of ours. I started out in school at the PS206, and then they built a brand new school right almost next to our house, PS254, where I did all my uh, little schoolwork. And then ultimately I ended up at James Madison High School, which is not too far from us. And uh, I was, interestingly enough, there were close to 4,000 kids in James Madison High School. I was the only black kid there. 
and it was a very interesting <laughs> experience for me. And I ended up uh, making my way through the school and ended up being senior class president in my, in my graduating class. After high school, I went off to college, went to Howard University down in Washington, and they had a flying club. There were some of the guys who came back from World War II who were, had been pilots, been in the as Tuskegee Airmen, and they uh, loved, loved to fly, and they asked me, you know, would I be interested in joining them? I said, you know, of course I would be interested in joining in with them. And I ended up uh, soloing in a Piper Cub. Now, a Piper Cub, if you don't know what it looks like and sounds like, it was a, had an engine about the size of a lawnmower. And it was a very, very easy airplane to fly, a lovely airplane, a little airplane to fly. But it started interfering with my schoolwork, and I kept saying, gee, you know, you want to go on to medical school. But then I kept making excuses, saying, well, gee, I don't think I have the money to go to medical school. Uh, maybe I'll go in the Air Force and uh, then go on the GI Bill and go to medical school that way. And I kept getting tugged by the ear to go into the Air Force, which I did ultimately uh, when I graduated from, high, from my uh, college class. Well, I went off to Randolph Field in Texas and became uh, an aviation cadet. And the airplane that we flew there was the T-6, which was 10 times the horsepower of the Piper Cub. It was huge by comparison. It was a monstrously large airplane and a really it took a lot of skill and focus to fly it well. I went through in my flying school in the T-6, ended up graduating, and I went off to become an instructor pilot. That was my first assignment at Waco, in Waco, Texas. Well, I stayed at Waco, and instructed there, and uh, ultimately I uh, went to Luke Air Force Base to fly P-51s because the Korean War was hot and heavy at that time, and they needed reciprocating engine pilots, pe people who could fly uh, other than light aircraft or fly jets. So I flew P-51s at Luke, ended up going to Korea in 1952. I was welcomed pretty well. Uh, there was a, one other black pilot there who left the day I arrived, and I felt a little bit strange about that. But also, my flight commander says, hey, Rock, Guess what? Listen to this. I said, listen to what? That's Pyongyang Polly. I said, point Pyongyang. And on the radio, I hear this voice, welcome to Korea, Lieutenant Curtis Rock. My name is Pyongyang Polly, and I tell you now that you will be hanged from the Wanju Bridge with the rest of the criminals in the 12th Fighter Bomber Squadron. I almost passed out when I heard that. The base was called Dog Patch, and, and it was really a doggy patch. It was not well tended. We slept in tents, and colder than a witch's heart, and we flew with these 51s that everybody kind of looked down on because they were World War II airplanes and the jets were coming to everybody else. We ended up uh, ultimately getting rid of our P-51s 
by flying him off to Japan to a place called Itazuki. And we landed. I landed my airplane, cleared down the runway, and I was looking for the taxiway to turn off. And the next thing I knew, my airplane collapsed all around me. I said, the diagonal old thing is just broken. And I was bent over. I was under the gun sight. And then when I got my helmet and tried to get my helmet off of my head, couldn't do that. And I said, gun, what the heck is the matter with this thing? And I, of course, I had turned on all the switches and whatnot. And I touched my helmet again and pulled my hands down. And my fingertips were on fire. And I said, oh, Mike. <laughs> and about that time, people were running to the air, toward the airplane. There was a little Japanese fireman standing at the wing route on the left side. And I, every time I tried to get my head up and get out to get a breath of fresh air, he would hit me, hit me in the face with fomite. And then there was this tremendous crowd of guys around the airplane. They were kept saying, come on, Rock, get out of there, get out of there, and whatnot. I said, well, I wish the heck I could get out of here because I was tucked under, I was right under my gun sight. I was pushed forward under the gun sight. Ultimately, Ultimately, someone uh, pulled on me and tugged, and they started tugging, and they finally got me out of the dug and thing. And I looked at it, and I saw that there was another airplane sitting right on top of my airplane. I was pushed down by the uh, one of the the uh, headrest on my armor plate had tipped over, and that was one of the things pushing me forward and under the gun sight, the whole dog and seat structure had collapsed o over me. It was uh, kind of a strange feeling, scary as the dickens. The, the propeller of the aircraft that had crashed into me, the engine had stopped, stalled out, and the propeller went over my head and was resting Oh, over the nose of my aeroplane. Uh, I was under his air, under his nose, under the nose of that aeroplane. It was uh, something I, I really couldn't fathom. I couldn't quite make any kind of sense out of it until I ultimately saw pictures of it. And I said, holy mackerel. <laughs> that was, I was pretty well trapped. Ended up in the hospital and stayed there for six weeks. As soon as they got me out, the fire Marshall said, clear the area, and both airplanes burnt and exploded. When I came out of the hospital, I went back to my unit, but I was among the uh, group that had no prior jet experience, and my unit was being uh, outfitted with F-86s, so we were all sent away to uh, various operations, and I ended up <clears throat> up at Seoul, and uh, I was back flying T-6s and chasing Bed Check Charlie. I flew several missions, never never saw the guy, never saw the airplane, got shot at a lot by our own people in the middle of the night, and uh, ultimately I got my orders to go back uh, to the States ended up flying uh, back to Arizona, Williams Air Force Base, which is a great place. And I got into uh, T-33s, which were jet trainers, ended up uh, doing a series of training films under the auspices of uh, the uh, training command uh, and they were about flying the T-33 and the emergency procedures and so forth. And the films were uh, uh, conducted, or for the producer of the films was a guy by the name of uh, George Stevens, George Stevens, Jr., who was a second lieutenant at the time. 
I did the aerial flying, you know, for uh, several of the sequences, formation flying, uh, one of the emergency procedures uh, uh, indicating that the tip tanks were not feeding properly and how do you jettison these things. And uh, being partly Scotch, uh, I didn't want to jettison those tip tanks full as I burned them down to empty and decided to jettison them while the camera airplanes were following me and uh, punched them off about 500 feet above the ground. The next thing I knew, we were flipped upside down. <laughs> the cameraman in the back seat of my airplane says, whoops, <laughs> and I said, that, this is no good. So uh, we got the thing up right side up, and I asked him if he wanted to stay with the airplane. He says, well, I don't have too many options there, uh, Lieutenant Rock. Uh, yeah, if you stay in it, I'll stay in it. And we finally got the dug up thing where we could uh, get it down to stall speeds and things like that, and uh, brought it in for an uneventful landing. One of the other things that that era did for me was to teach me how to fly with the foreign students and to respect their uh, lifestyles and so forth. I had one kid come to me one day and he said, um, may I ask you a question? I said, sure, certainly. Uh, you know, Arizona is very hot. I said, yes it is. Is there a problem? Well, I, I, I perspire a lot here. I said, yeah, it's just because of the heat. Is there a problem? He says, well, my instructor, Lieutenant so-and-so, keeps telling me no sweat. <laughs> and it's impossible not to perspire. <laughs> but these are some of the things that happened to you when you had kids who were from different cultures and so forth, way not American. Uh, the Italians had certain characteristics, the French had other characteristics, and it was a very interesting life experience for me. Um, I ended up uh, heading up the instrument training group, uh, flight really, and uh, one day I got a call from wing headquarters, they said, uh, uh, we have a visitor who we'll, we're bringing down to your operation, and uh, he will tell you his needs. Oh, okay. So about 10 minutes later, staff car comes up to my ops, and out steps this guy in a foreign uniform and uh, the driver and also U.S. Air Force escort. The man's name was Air Marshal Steinhoff. Steinhoff was one of the most recognized people in World War II. He had 176 air victories against Allied aircraft. I looked at this man and his face was that almost of a caricature. It had been severely disfigured and I learned that that disfiguration was due to having him having also been burnt in an aircraft accident, and his face was all reconstructed, but the man flew an airplane like he was born in it. He was here in the States to see how the an airplane, the one, uh, the 104, F-104, which the Air Force was selling to the German Air Force. And it was kind of 
not very much of an airplane. It was more like a rocket. It had very small wings and whatnot. And the German Air Force, people were getting killed in that airplane at a very high rate. It was not a very good airplane. But anyway, Steinhoff had been here to kind of monitor that operation. My oldest brother, Preston, uh, who was our real aviation mentor, uh, at the beginning of World War II, uh, wanted to fly in, in the Air Force, or at that time, the Army Air Corps. And it wasn't until a couple of years after the war started that they started allowing blacks to become pilots. And he became one of the so-called Tuskegee Airmen. And he was actually, uh, very interestingly, was held in sort of reserve status, waiting, going into the tra air training program and while he was in reserve status, he did menial work at Keesler Field in Mississippi. All of the guys were kept in as, as enlisted people doing pretty menial work. Ultimately, they opened up the program and, he start, and they started guys going through. He was in a program in 1944. And pretty late in the, in the operation and before he finished his flying training, the war ended. But he was one of the uh, so-called people recognized as Tuskegee Airmen. My middle brother, Gardner, was the last one of us to go through flight training. He was uh, an engineering student at City College in New York and uh, in the ROTC, Army ROTC, and he was uh, called into active duty as a second lieutenant and he was down in, uh, in Georgia uh, as an artillery guy and he saw a P-51 flying around one day and he says, I know that's you, I know that's you, I'm going to fly too. So he went, he put in for flight training and he ended up uh, in Korea at the same time I was there. And uh, we used to see each other on a fairly regular basis. Sometimes we, I thought I saw him when I was attacking targets because they were, he was over there spotting targets for us with smoke charges. And I'd come off a target half blacked out and I'd say, get out of my way, get out of my way, no, I don't want you. <laughs> and, but anyway, yeah, we both had a uh, very, very close relationship, brotherly relationship. And fortunately, we both got through the Korean War pretty well unscathed. Uh, of course, I had my accident. Guys in my outfit would uh, be l listening to their records or what have you in their bunks or in the tents, and all of a sudden they would hear, and they say, hey, Rock, that's your brother. And of course, there he was coming into our base flying in his little uh, liaison airplane called L-19, little Cessna. And he would come and bring me boots and a, and a, and a uh, uh, sleeping bag, nice cozy sleeping bag, because we had very poor <laughs> supplies. And uh, he would and take me up with him, go to his place which was pretty close to the front lines, 
and we'd have dinner together, and he'd fly me back to my base, things of the sort. It was a very wonderful experience for being in a war. One of the things that we learned very early in flying is how to use uh, phrases that make up our pr various procedures. One we call a gump check, which is gas undercarry mixture and pitch, prop pitch. This is a pre-landing check that we re uh, learn to over and over again, and it becomes quite automatic. Uh, another one is called the sifters, C-I-G-F-T-P-R-S, which is a pre-takeoff checklist. So one day, one of the guys had a young student in his, uh, this was in the T-6s down in Waco, and uh, was entering the traffic pattern and it was a foreign student flying, and the instructor said, uh, okay, Mr. So forth, uh, well, I'll call him Papadopoulos. Mr. Papadopoulos uh, performed the gump check. And there was no response from the student. A few moments later, the instructor said, uh, Mr. Papadopoulos, jump, uh, gump check, please, gump check. Nothing. Mr. Papadopoulos, gump check, gump, gump. The canopy was thrown back, the kid went out the <laughs> airplane <laughs> and left the instructor all alone in the back seat. We finally had a mission change at Williams Air Force Base, away from basic flying, flying training, and we got F-86s for tactical training. And what a joy that airplane was. It was easy to fly, very responsive, great machine, and I loved it. But I was also building up a lot of flying time. I had now a lot of flying experience behind me and kept hearing that MATS, the Military Air Transport Service, was losing pilots right and left, kids bailing out, going to the airlines. And one day I get the word, we are transferring you to the Military Air Transport Service. That meant I would be flying big four-engine airplanes, no, no little fast go fast fighter plane. It would be hauling mommies and kids and fathers and uncles and sisters back and forth all over the planet. And it was kind of a real letdown, but. Ultimately, I ended up being sent to McGuire Air Force Base here in New Jersey and going through training into the four-engine C-118 airplane, which was the military version of the DC-6 that airlines were all flying at the time. It was uh, kind of a letdown, but it, it open up another venue for me that I was able to fly to different places that I never even thought about before, such as Adana, Turkey, for example. Adana, Turkey is way in the corner of the GNC, and I flew in there one day, and it was absolutely empty. There was this big airfield Nobody there, nothing happening. Ultimately, Master Sergeant comes walking out to the airplane. I said, hey, Sergeant, what's going on here? He said, sir, 
I said, there's nothing going on at this airport. Oh, yes, sir. I said, is this an Air Force airport? Oh, yes, the U.S. Air Force Air, air Base. And I said, are you sure? He said, yes, sir, quite sure. I said, that again. It's empty. No, no, no. There are people here, sir. But I don't see any. But they're here, sir. And I took him at his word. And finally, I departed. <coughs> then, sometime later, I heard about the U-2. And there was a guy who flew a U-2 over Russia, got shot down. His name was Francis Gary Powers. And he had flown from Adana, Turkey. All the places I flew into were Thule, Greenland, Sonderstrom, Greenland. Sonderstrom is like flying into a right angle valley or a hallway, if you will, very, very tight valley. At the far end of this valley was the airport. You flew down this valley day, and, day or night, very kind of interesting place to fly into. Thule, Greenland. Thule was the farthest, most northern base that we had. And it was up there so that we could surveil Russia, you know, pick up information about Russian operations and so forth. Goose Bay, Labrador, another fantastically interesting place. But one of the things about Goose Bay was that you could get the best doggone lobster you ever saw in your life in 50 cents a piece. <laughs> we would order the lobsters flying through there to pick them up on the way back home uh, by the crate. Flew into Frankfurt, Germany, Berlin, Germany, Paris, Madrid, the Azor Islands. It was quite a quite a eye-opening and rewarding experience to fly in those airplanes. Had one flight one time, young fellow, about 10 years old, came up to the cockpit, and uh, we would let the kids come up, and we'd talk, talk airplanes with them. And this kid came up, and he, he said, I know what makes this airplane fly. I said, you do? What, the, what is that? And he reached over my arm and grabbed the turn knob for the air for the autopilot and he gave it a big crank and the airplane went into a big turn to the right i smacked his hand <laughs> put the airplane back on course nice and easy and i had to put my jacket on and whatnot i took the kid by the hand back to the cabin and his father was i don't remember how a colonel or Brigadier General or something, and I said, sir, this is your young Lind Lindbergh here, and that's why we had that sudden turn to the right. He said, but would you keep him in his seat from now on? <laughs> and uh, it was just a, a very eye-opening experience. Could be very boring, just making holes in the sky, but compared to to flying fighters and trainers and things of this sort. I left the Air Force uh, to go to work for Loral Electronic Systems, which is an aerospace company, as a human factors engineer. And I spent the next 25 years working with various programs at Laurel.
this is what I'm commanded to fly these days. My kids tell me stay away from real airplanes. I might hurt my old self, but this is fun. I can go up and down my desk with this. I love it.